Thank you for joining me for another Quick Hits Conversation. I'm Dr. Robin, AKA Mental MacGyver. I provide luxury level, high performance support and coaching to executives, founders, celebrities, and athletes. With me today, I have Jim Tam. He is the principal client director at Corn Ferry's Digital Group, where he advises organizations on how to improve their sales effectiveness through using world-class sales methodology and technology. I have Stuart Wiggins. He's with Induna Advisors, where he offers fractional chief operating officer services and brings resources together to help scale your business. And I have Katarina Von Maydell. She helps business leaders build disruptive business models and define key leverage points to create powerful change and impact using a process of systemic organizational and human evolution. The question I have today, how do you maintain a poker face when it's best not to give away what you're thinking? Jim, what are you thinking? When I got this question, I was, I, was, I had to really think about it. I, I guess in the post-pandemic era, if you could just shut off your camera, I think that would certainly be a good way not to betray yourself. Yeah. But I do think that it takes a lot of practice in order not to show what you're really thinking. I guess in my role in business development, you, know, you show your poker face. I mean, if you show what you're thinking, you can actually uh, lose your leverage in negotiation. Mm -hmm. I think the best way to go about doing it is if there's a way that you can prepare ahead of time of answers or questions that might be thrown at you mm. so that uh, you're not surprised by something. That's probably the, just, just the best way. I, I'll give you a little bit of background. When I was in the military, you had to really work hard to keep a poker face because mm. they're convoluted as it is. The adage was, if you're smiling, you're not doing your job. You would have to keep a poker face. But then when I got out of the military, then people misread my body language because mm -hmm. they always thought that I was you know, either angry or I was displeasure, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've become, I'd like to think, really attuned at trying to gauge what my face is saying. So like if I need to keep a poker face, like during these, I take notes. So mm -hmm. if I put my head down and take notes that I'm not giving away, if somebody says something that's really off the wall, I don't have to give away my expression the mm -hmm. fact that it was off the wall. But even in meetings in that, I will, I always have a notebook with me. Now, if it's a one-to-one -one conversation and somebody says something, all bets are off because I might give away my reaction. Katerina. So I love, Jim, what you said, that there's times where you really absolutely have to keep a poker face. And then Stuart, you added the piece as well, that there's also times we don't want to keep poker faces. And really, that I think is one of the first things we have to think about when we're trying to remember or trying to figure out if we use a poker face, because it actually can be really damaging to relationships. If we need to be building trust, um, then we absolutely need to be showing what's going on inside of us. But if we do need to keep a poker face, if it is absolutely the right time, what we need to think about is where do our facial expressions come from? And as you guys, as everybody probably listening knows, it's not just the facial expressions, but it's also things like, you know, are your veins popping? Are you doing something with your hands? Are there tells? When poker, they talk about tells that when people have a really good hand, all of a sudden they start, you know, women will play with their hair or you know, everybody's got their tells. So it's not just the facial expressions. And I think if we think about where those come from, all of that comes from our nervous system. So there's things like you guys were talking about um, where we can do things in the moment to reduce our visual tells, our, our facial expressions and other signals as well. But really, ideally, what we want to do is train ourselves to really work with our physiology, to really work with our nervous system so that we can recognize what are the signals that we're getting and which ones should we respond to. And also that we can calm ourselves in a very healthy way. We don't want to suppress things. I mean, if we're in a very if we're in a crisis situation, obviously, then we do. But it's learning about how to work with the nervous system, our physiological signals. Sometimes you do want to show signals, but you want to be showing very specific ones. So again, it's learning to work with our nervous system in order to regulate what we're actually showing physically. I, that's really good. And I love what uh, Jim said about surprise. I think that that's the one that gets us when somebody says something that's surprising or disgust. That's yeah. another one that's really hard to control. And I think for me, prepping, absolutely recognizing what else other than just my face, I also know I am very expressive. And if you watch quick hits, you know, like I reply to people sometimes just with my face when we're, when we're doing these. For me, I try to think about what would be an appropriate response that would be helpful in this situation with my face. And if someone says something to me that's surprising to me, if surprise is not the right answer, 
I may try to give some kind of other facial, something different than surprise if I think that's going to be bad for them. I would just maybe add on to what Stuart's saying about the military. You think about like how much you got as a leader and so many troops are looking at you, not by what you say, but your body language and things. If you're scared, they're going to be scared. So you got to make sure that you have this countenance that says, I got this, right? And I, and then, and then we kept leading said about the nervous system. So true. One time I interviewed a young lady fresh out of college and she just turned red because she was so nervous. Even though she was trying to say the right things, you can just tell there's a whole bunch of stuff that in her, around her body that was just kind of betraying what was coming out of her mouth. And I kind of felt sorry for her and it says, time out. Here's a glass of water. Let's do this again. And how nice of you to notice that and be able to help her. I mean, you yeah. could have just gone on through like too bad, figure it out. <laughs> So is part of keeping a poker face, like we're, we're all seasoned. Is it something that you learn when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate? How did you figure that out? Failure. I don't mean that facetiously, but I mean, like you, if you're a human being, you're going to learn from the responses of those around you and you have to work to modify your responses. I don't think I can modify my response to surprise if it's something that was completely unexpected. I think that maybe not the initial reaction, but the follow-up reaction, how I recover may be more important because surprise is surprise. I'll give you an example. The day Michael Jackson died, my, my assistant came in and said, did you hear? Well, I know I had surprise on my look, on my face. There was no way in the world that I was going to cover that up. So I think it's important to recognize that. And if you have to change your demeanor, recognize it and then change it as quickly as possible. But I think only through failure and mistakes do you recognize it and change it. I also think that it all depends on whether you're an emotional person to begin with. If you're like a roller coaster that's always high and low, it's tough to have that poker face. But if you've always been stoic your whole life, unemotional, people don't know, never would never know what you're thinking because you never actually reviewed yourself, whether it's good or bad. I think there's a lot of learned behavior in that. You know, what we've already talked about is the cultures that we work in and the environments that we work in. But there's also um, all sorts of sociodemographic and psychographic elements that fit into it as well. It fits, it, our emotional reactions and our patterns of behavior come from basically our families and our childhood experiences and the cultures that we grew up in. Um, so you know, as women, we're taught that we're supposed to smile. We're taught that we're always supposed to show positive signals, friendly signals. While men often are being told you have to be stoic, you have to be strong, don't show weakness. So there's a lot of ingrained, culturally ingrained, but there's other factors that fit into it as well that determine, that sort of predetermine what our behaviors are. But the beautiful thing is you know, what neuroplasticity and other types of research on the nervous system are showing us is we can actually change almost everything. So we can pretty well learn with the right amount of work, with the right support, we can actually mod moderate our responses, which would include our facial responses. So I think it's very much learned. I don't believe that personality related things are genetic. Um, and that basically means that we can learn how to moderate what we're showing to the world. Do you think that you use poker face more to protect yourself or to protect someone else? I would jump in and both say both. Oh. There's times where you want to, I mean, there's a lot of times what we've already talked about on the call today is you know, if you're in negotiations, if you're a leader, if you need to convey a certain emotion in order to help the people around you, we're doing that sort of more for the group. We're doing it also for ourselves so that we can achieve our goals. But I think a lot of times we're also doing it. And Jim, this is what you and actually Stuart were both talking about, is that you know, if you're a leader and you show fear, that will then spread into other people. So sometimes we need to do it to protect the morale, protect what people are feeling. And sometimes we're just doing it to be kind. Mm -hmm. I will say this, that I was in command before the first Gulf War. You have to bring everybody in and tell them we're going to go to war. You can feel everybody's looking at you and they're <laughs> trying to gauge your body language. They're trying to gauge your words and they're not maybe necessarily hearing your words. They might be looking at your body or mm -hmm. vice versa. I think those types of things as a leader, it's important because people are going to take buy signs from you on how they should respond. So Jim, do you think it's more for you or more for others? It's, it's mostly for others, I think, because I can, mm -hmm. I, nobody knows what's, what's going on in my head. I do think that everybody needs a poker face. And if, so if you haven't been able to get one, and not, for me, and we don't have time to talk about it, but a poker face isn't a blank stare. Mm -hmm. It can't be just 
it has to be something else. But I think everyone needs one as an adult and I think it's cultivated. So thank you so much for having this conversation with me. And I look forward to speaking to each of you again very soon.